Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us. We have two terrific poets with us today, Alicia Hartnoy and Adele Slaughter. Alicia will read first, and then Adele. Poet, memoirist, scholar, and human rights activist, Alicia Partnoy. Partnoy is the author, translator, or editor of 12 books. Professor Emerita at Loyola Marymount University in Los Angeles. Her work has been published in Spanish, English, Hebrew, Turkish, Bengali, and French. Best known for the little school, Tales of Disappearance and Survival, about her own disappearance in Argentina, her poetry collection, Flowering Fires, Fuegos Floralis, excuse my Spanish, translated by Gail Ronsky, received the first Settlement House American Poetry Prize. Her most recent book, co-written with Dr. Martina Ram Ramirez, is the testimony of her transgender friend, happier as a woman, transforming friendships, transforming lives. Here's a superb poet, Alicia Partnoy. Thank you. Thank you, Harry. And thank you, Beth, for giving us um, the contact. I'm going to cheat. I'm going to start reading from uh, prose. And that's the little school, but the um, chapter. And the reason why I'm reading from this book is because um, the book was evidence in the trials against the genocide perpetrators in my country. And uh, recently, like the last weekend, the, um, there was an election and the new president elect um, is threatening to release all the genocide perpetrators or the guilty ones for killing my friends at the little school uh, for disappearing children. And so it's very important for us to continue um, denouncing, continue testifying. I curse the poetry of those who do not take sides from poetry is a weapon loaded with future by Gabriel Celaya. Um, and this chapter is called Poetry. I'm going to read a little bit of it. And it's my, my experience in this little um, small concentration camp in Argentina back in the 70s. The prisoner's small room, noon time. The new prisoners lie stretched out on the floor. They were brought in yesterday and they haven't been badly beaten yet. Chamame allowed us to talk all morning long. Chamame says that the other guards want to take it out on him because he's easy on us. He claims he let Graciela Vasca's sister write a letter to her family and that he himself mailed it. Why don't you recite a poem? The whisper rises from the floor by my bunk bed. Little Alicia writes poems. Daniel illustrates them. My mom said proudly, I was nine years old then. When I was a small girl, I wrote poems about the plants and birds. When I turned 12 or 13, I began writing about my sorrows. Now, I can't even do that. I comfort myself by thinking that my reason for not writing is lack of paper and pencil, but the real reason is this anesthetic inside. When the flesh of poetry is anesthetized, it is impossible to build poems. So um, I'm, I'm uh, just reading up to here. Then there are, I recite poems to the prisoners. Uh, they bring a new prisoner, and he is uh, laying on the floor. We were all blindfolded with our hands tied. And so um, I'm, this is the end of the, the tale poetry. I hear the iron grate open. Out comes the metallic sound of the soup pan that a guard slides along the floor of the other room. Meanwhile, Zorsal enters our room to untie our hands so we can eat. He discovers that the other new prisoner has a loose blindfold and he punches him. When I hear the muffled moan, I feel guilty. 
Instead of reciting poems, I should have explained to the new prisoners. I should have told them that at the little school, we are beaten whenever our blindfolds are loose. So this is an option that um, which poets should, should never, should never, 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 ever face. I'm going to read from um, Revenge of the Apple, is uh, my book of poems from um, the prison and exile. After the concentration camp, I was transferred to a prison for political prisoners uh, where human rights organizations knew we were there before we were disappeared. Uh, biographical data. They wouldn't my homeland out from under me what they call exile. That is, all of a sudden, the ground was gone and distance lay everywhere before me. But one day, before that happened, they stripped me of my freedom and then, gasping for air, surrounded by iron bars, I felt a little better than when they grabbed my daughter out of my arms on that day. Everything, the future, was gone. You could say I had too much of my own life. And yet, I still remember the day the military put my homeland behind bars. On that day, I had too much courage and the fear was gone. That's where it all began. I'm going to read. Um, when, when I started to recite poetry in public, I was uh, 20 two years old and uh, and it was in this prison in Buenos Aires. And so my 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 joke is that I had a truly, truly captive audience. I'm gonna read a poem in Spanish that I wrote in jail back then um, in 1977. So old. and then I'm gonna read the translation. Those translations were by Richard Schaff. Doña Serpiente. ¿Qué va a hacer Doña Serpiente cuando vea de repente que el árbol que ha talado reproduce simiente? Cuando la rama cortada crezca de nuevo hacia el cielo, cuando el ala mutilada vuelva a remontar el vuelo, cuando se nos vuelva canto, el llanto y el desconsuelo. ¿Qué va a hacer Doña Serpiente cuando a fuerza de pelearlo todo sea diferente? Donia Snake. What will you do, Donia Snake, when suddenly you see that the felled tree reproduces new seeds, when the severe branch grows anew toward the sky, when the mutilated wing once again soars, when our tears, our afflictions turn to songs? What will you do, Donia Snake, when through our struggling, everything is different? I I visited the occupied territories back in 1988 when the first intifada, um, when the kids were throwing stones to the soldiers and then their bones were broken. Uh, by the soldiers. I was in a delegation of women writers back then. And in my book, Volando Bajito, Little Low Flying, um, translated by Gail Ronsky, my voice uh, in English for decades here in the States, um, is this poem about that visit, Old Jerusalem Chronicle of the Intifada, um, 19. 87. I, I was there in 1988. And then I rededicated it to Rachel Corey in 2003. For those who were very little and don't remember, Rachel Corey was a um, woman from Seattle who stood in front of a tank that was uh, going to demolish a, a house in uh, Palestine. So white they hurt these ancestral rocks, crashed under the pressure of three drops of blood. It was here where Jesus knew thorns. 
Over the same rock, soldiers drag the punished body of one more Palestinian. What are those women doing? What do they want to see? Why do they come from so far away bringing pencils, notebooks, cameras, eyes? Haven't these foreigners discovered the enormous usefulness of the onion? the blood on white rocks, and the punished body of one more Palestinian hurts them. Suddenly, people shout, enough! Everyone unites in one, and in one synchronized movement, men in uniforms put on their gas masks. Then everything turns, runs, avalanches. The eyes cry chemical tears, and out of the sprayed chaos of bruised produce, catapulted loaves of bread, far beyond the territory of the little marketplace, out of the crowd of bodies with which fear pushes here and there, savior emerges. The hand of an old woman who puts in my hand a piece of onion. Then I learn. We all learn that here in Jerusalem, as opposed to any other place in the world, onions are antidotes for detaining tears. 35 years ago, 30, 35 years after, 35 years of cruel repression, 1400 dead people in Israel, killed by Hamas, and thousands and thousands of Palestinians killed in the bombing of Gaza that is taking place right now. I haven't tuned in the news, so it's always with hope that I tune them in and try to find out if finally the ceasefire has happened. I'm going to read uh, Ars Politica, Arte Politica. It's from my book, Flower Empires, Juegos Plurales, translated also by Gail Ronsky. I, I dedicated it a couple of years ago to Breonna Taylor. George Floyd, Ramona Medina, Andres Guardado, and Vanessa Guillén. Um, Ars political. A verse stripped of all manipulation and adornment. So no one can say that after Auschwitz, after the conquest, after so many diminutive esmas, so many tiny Sabres and Shatilas and Rwandas and Kosovos and all of the bombed out Gazas, so that no one can say that nothing remains for us to say, that nothing still dryly cuts apart the brain, the tongue, and whatever other viscera are given the luxury of throbbing with grief. So um, I'm going to read it in Spanish. Uh, but I, um, I will clarify for those who di didn't get it. Adornment is a subtle mention to um, Theodore Adorno. Uh, who said, uh, who, who was quoted as saying that after the Holocaust, there was no possibility of writing poetry. But uh, doing some research, I found out that, that what he actually said is poetry was going to be different. Arte Politica. Hoy dedicado a Briona Taylor, George Floyd, Ramona Medina, Andrés Guardado y Vanessa Guillén. Un verso desnudo de todo malabar y adorno. Para que nadie diga que después de Auschwitz, que después de la conquista, que después de tantas diminutas esmas, de tantas pequeñitas sabras y yatilas de Ruanda, de Kosovo, de todas las galas, gazas bombardeadas, para que nadie diga que nada que decir nos queda, que nada ya nos parte en seco el cerebro, la lengua y alguna que otra víscera que se da el lujo de palpitar los duelos. So here I, I mention Esma. 
ESMA is the School of Mechanics of the Navy, uh, of the, um, in Argentina School of Mechanics. Um, and that was the biggest secret detention camp where about 5,000 people were killed uh, during the time I was disappeared in the little school. And it's now a uh, treasure for the humanity. Uh, United Nations, I don't remember the words in English, but has declared it recently, a uh, few months ago, as a historic place to be treasured by the humanity and preserved by humanity. And um, that's ESMA. And I guess the other places I could say um, people can can Google, right? They can Google. Um, I, I'll share, I'll share with you another a book of mine that is not really a book of mine. Uh, Evangelina Arce is the mother of Ciudad Juarez. Evangelina's daughter, Graciela, uh, sorry, Silvia, Silvia Arce, uh, was disappeared. And this uh, poetry collection are the poems that Evangelina wrote. Evangelina only went to second grade. And then um, when they, after they disappeared, her daughter, you can see Evangelina Arce in, in a movie, in a documentary that is, you can find on YouTube that um, is called Senorita Extraviada. Uh, young missing woman, and it's about the the killings and impunity in Ciudad Juarez. And so she went only to second grade, but she started to write poetry when they almost killed her uh, for searching for truth. And I'm going to read one poem by Evangelina Arce. For my daughter, Silvia, daughter, I know you are not with me. A thousand times I know you are lost in another world. I thought this year I'd have you with me, that your children and I would celebrate with you. My dreams are to love and care for you so much in the loving arms of your children and mine, and your families, your sisters and brothers, your children who will never forget you, and your mother who is always with you. I yearn to see your light and that this path takes me to where you are. You were a little star shedding light on your path, a little shooting star. You were a pretty and happy rose, so cheerful and your perfume spilled in that place that no longer exists. There, your perfume penetrated. That was Sylvia Arce, and her poems were transcribed and uh, translated by my former students at Loyola Marymount University. And uh, I'm going to read from this heavy, heavy, uh, just the last poem. And uh, important book I just contributed, oops, I am uh, mirroring wrong. <laughs> um, and it's about the solidarity uh, shown in the United States uh, for the victims of the dictatorships, and especially in Chile. In Chile, um, we are commemorated, we commemorated this September, the 50 years after the military coup. Um, where dictator Pinochet took over. And I wrote a piece in this book uh, that went with, um, was part of an exhibit in New Mexico. I wrote uh, an essay that ends with this poem, uh, Commandments, that is in, in, in translation by another former student of mine, uh, Julia Horton. And um, and I'm going to close with this. Um, this is part of my last chapbook that was published in El Salvador, Ecos Lógicos y Otros Poemares, Logical Echoes and Other Poetries, Poesies, Commandments. Embrace then the no man's land that between the sea and the air becomes a song. 
distant memories will come into your grasp. In your mouth, a foreign flower will bloom, that which we gods call poetry, that which some humans call devotion. Let the sand resist the weight of your souls. Let the sea drink from the cups left behind. You will part the earth into furrows. The corn whose seeds you sowed will speak to the sky. It will tell the story of your compañeros, those whom the shipwreck has stolen, those who in the wind filled your sails, those who helped you drop anchor on the shore, the luminous ones who opened the narrow road to the revolution. Nest your anguish between the sea and the sky so that no one can see your pain. Then whisper a lengthy until forever. It's the only way you can tell them goodbye. Thank you. Well, thank you, Alicia, for your being a witness, your courage, your political acti activism for bringing us the truth. You, you have such courage and your observations are so precise and your indelible memory. And you have such a narrative strength and and vividness and and I always and I love the urgency of your voice to to bring us you know what we don't know and you know that one line you said something in your poem something like you were a little star shooting light on your path and you're bringing light to all of us so you know we could not be more appreciative of what you have done uh, let me ask you a couple of questions when did you write your first poem um, when I was a little girl, I, my mom would send me to buy stuff. You know, those those cities where nothing was dangerous, I would go to the stores and, and buy stuff, and I would come back with a poem. And and those, my mom is a visual artist. My mom is a painter, so I she supported that. Yeah, I was probably nine, eight, something like that. Were there a lot of books in your home? Yes, yes. Um, many of them were were burned during the dictatorship because out of fear. But yes, and, and my mom didn't let me have a card to the library because the only thing I wanted to do was to read. I didn't want to do any other chores but going for, you know, buy stuff and then, you know, bring in a poem or a flower. Um but yes, uh, I spent all, all, all my days reading, yes. <laughs> and who are some of the poets that influenced you what, before you started writing uh, poetry in a regular, uh, serious way? Well, uh, the, the Spanish Civil War, they call Civil War, it was actually pretty much a genocide uh, poets, and so that's Miguel Hernandez, Gabriel Celaya. I didn't, um, because that's the problem. We we hadn't, we, we didn't have access to women poets, except for Gabriela Mistral, you know, the Nobel Prize award from, from Chile, and whose poems I also read. I, I'm not sure if they influenced me, but, uh, but um, later on, I I met I could read Claribel Alegría, you know, from El Salvador, Nicaragua, and uh, I I would say that she is a huge influence. Yeah. And what is it about the poetry form that attracts you to it? Uh, I'm lazy. <laughs> I'm lazy. I couldn't. I say when I grow up, I write a novel. I keep telling my friend Jack Rosenthal, who uh, is, is an amazing novelist, uh, that, that that I will. And he said, "Well, you have to write, right?" And so, yeah, I, poetry has that. But I always say I have an open relationship with with poetry. Sometimes I'm I'm in bed with it with her, but sometimes I just. Uh, yeah, I had to write essays because of my profession, so I try to put poems in there. But uh, the music, the music, I'm not, I'm, I'm not a good singer, and sometimes I try to sing them, and it's awful. But uh, I, I don't have any shame, and I do sing my poems. But, uh, 
but but at the musicality, the musicality is is something. Yeah, you can say things with so very few words. You don't need to write for a long time. You don't need to sit down and write for hours. <laughs> well, you know, one time I asked this one poet. Actually, my wife did. You know why he writes poetry, and he said because you don't have to type so much. <laughs> oh well, so that's a uh, yeah. She's she's present here today. Is present always. Were you able to write in prison? We did write, um, not in the secret detention place, not in the concentration camp, but in prison. Uh, we wrote, but it it has to be um, in convoluted ways that the military didn't catch what we were saying because they would come and they would take our poems, our notebooks, and they would punish us for things we said, or they would interrogate us for say, things we wrote. But I wrote a lot of stuff for, to my, for my daughter. My daughter was a an year and a half when I was in prison, and she was four when I, we, we came as refugees to the States. Um, and, and so I wrote those poems and short stories for my kid that then were smuggled out by other women uh, for their own children. And... Yeah, we had a poetry magazine that we tied with a with towel with a thread from towel. We would dye uh, pages. We would boil um, beets, you know, because they were spread, and so we would have pink poetry notebooks, and we would have contests in there. But whenever the the guards came for their searches, they would take away all of that. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for your courage and for thank your precise you. observations. You know, you you bring us news, which is what poetry should do that we don't know, and you bring darkness to light. So it's really, uh, you know, we're really thankful to you for the voice that you bring us with all of what you have seen and witnessed. So thank you very much, Alicia Partnoy. Thank you for letting me say something in this terrible moment. I, this, this is a relief for me. Thank you. Our next poet, Adele Slaughter, is a poet living in Los Angeles. She wrote and directed Jealousy 2014 based on her novel of the same name. Slaughter's first book of poetry, What the Body Remembers, was published by Storyline Press in 1994 and has been reissued by Red Hand Press. She taught in California colleges and has been a journalist covering health for USA Today. Adele, would you please uh, come on the show visually and, and audio? She taught in California colleges, I repeat, and has been a journalist covering health for USA Today. In 2004, she was awarded a National Journalism Prize for her coverage of multiple sclerosis. In 1993, the White House Commission on Presidential Scholars named her a distinguished teacher. Currently, she has published her second book of poetry titled 100 and is writing a novel. Here's a splendid poet, Adele Slaughter. Thank you. Thanks so much, Harry. And uh, Alicia, thank you so much for your poetry and your work and your, you remind me of a poet named Nina Kassan, who was uh, a beautiful, uh, you know, stunning poet who lived, you know, behind the Iron Curtain. And her, um, she came to the United States and um, in uh, they took all of her books and burned them because they read her journals and they just took them all out and burned them and then she couldn't go back home and her husband was stuck there and she was stuck here in the US and uh, he died and then she was like oh well my life's over but uh, uh, american poets found her and made her sort of famous again it was kind of you know a be beautiful and sad story she was Sort of like a a Marlene Dietrich drawn by Picasso. <laughs> you know, she's a wonderful poet. Anyway, your your work reminds me of you know her your your story reminds me of her story as well. Thank you so much for all your work. 
Um, I'm going to read a couple of poems from my first book, uh, What the Body Remembers, and then I'm going to move on to the book I just finished. And um, I would like to dedicate this reading to my mother who died this month a couple of years ago um, and to my teacher, Eureka, who um, has been inspiring me to love myself in a way that is always been sort of hard for me. Um, my poetry is much more um, about my inner life and about uh, the trials of that, let's say. Um, the first poem is called Poem to Save a Marriage. Please notice the delicate blue three-petaled flowers on the windowsill and also that I've washed our dinner dishes from last night. It's kind of like a, a joke, really, a funny poem. And I always like to say, it didn't work. Um, this poem I'm reading for you, Rico, because um, she's actually, when I say she's my teacher, she's actually my tennis teacher. She's a tennis coach. And I gave her my book of poetry. She read every poem and circled the line she liked. And then we sat where she read it to me. And this was her favorite poem because she said, how did you know this? How did you get inside my head? Um, her husband that she loved very much died and she um, became quite depressed. And this poem is called Renaming Depression. And it has an epigraph from a poem by Stephen Dunn. He writes, and the Eskimos with 26 words for snow, such a fine alertness to what variously presses down. Renaming depression. Call it despair. Sleepless nights, waking at 4 a.m., the mind racing to the next chore and the next until they screech and peel out, leaving rubber on the pavement. Call it heartache. The emptiness inside the barrel of the body, where the well where no coins drop. Where hellos come back disembodied. Call it melancholia. A load-spirited self lifts up like heavy drapes full of dust. You wheeze and weep. Call it despondency. A teddy bear stuck with a pin. It does not respond. The teddy always grins. Until you find it lifeless. Stuffing strewn across the nursery floor. Don't call it moody or mumpish. Although you are swollen and out of shape, it is not sorrow or grief because no one has died. Not anyone we can give a funeral to or actually bury. You are not morose or somber because those words imply something has happened to cause you pain. This feeling of hopelessness now exists in spite of your mother. You are eating out your heart. To your horror, you find yourself with trembling hands and cannot eat real food, just the stored up food of self. You are listless all Sunday long, the worst day for its lack of structure. Soul sick, nothing and everything you can say preys on your mind. You are sullen, gloomy in the dumps, and not really very good company. Even though I poke fun for relief, it hurts when I manage to understand such despair. I'm disheartened by your desolate soul. I would put my hand in front of the nails, but like Mary, I have to watch this pain until you come back to life and learn once more love, light, wind fire, and the pleasure of earth when plants grow and move the dirt aside. So um, my, um, this book, 100, uh, 100 is, um, it began because 
uh, one year I decided to write a poem a day for a year for 365 days. And um, it was quite a wonderful process. And in the process, I, um, well, I found one funny thing. Every day I would avoid writing the poem until about 1130. And I would write it quickly. And then the next day I would maybe work on the poem, rewrite the poem. But again, I would think I'm going to write a poem at some point. And I would always wait till the very last minute. So uh, it was interesting. And then I took the 365 poems and pulled out a hundred of the best ones and worked on them and rewrote them and have this book a hundred did 100. And so I decided rather than title the poems, I would just number them. So there it's one through 100 poems. And I'm just going to read a selection of those poems to you. Um, one. Is it best to line up all the bottles by size, large to small? Or let them sit on the shelf in whatever sequence you set them down? There's no answer to the question, really. But it's easier to find object when everything has its place. Time creates a widening circle of disorder, and we lose more every day. The list is endless. Glasses, keys, courage, heart, weight, lovers. It seems harder and harder to let go. Still, like it or not, we are becoming weightless. Either we release what has been taken or fill our pockets with the things that will drown us. Two, this is a poem after Pablo Neruda. A virus tight in my chest. Poetry won't leave me. I cough up words, odd birds that insist on chirping outside my window. One strikes the glass pane. I pick up the stunned creature, cradle it till it can fly. A blessing, a curse. The verse in my ears, tangle in my hair, get lost in the laundry. Words I try to get rid of like a broken umbrella. She finds her way down the cracked chimney, through rat holes, as sunlight on a wall. She does not care. Poetry does not care. Caught in my hands, caught in my throat, caught in my heart, until she's gone again. Five. All night, the moon, wolf moon, achingly full, hangs in a pale sky. sky illuminates our sleeping bodies. Your breath heavy, deep like a cavern. I wake easily. We glow in the dark, our house and the two of us, blue embers of loneliness. So there, in a strange way, when you do a poem a day, they are like, hidden moments or illuminated moments of the day, you know? And um, so, and sometimes they are um, little perceptions of how we relate to one another, but this is called, this is six. I wonder how you love me in spite of my annoying habits. I admit it, I don't screw lids on jars. You shake a bottle, salad dressing covers the wall. It's a family trait, alcoholism or clogged arteries not screwing lids on. As sorry as I am, I hate admitting I'm wrong. You laugh, you hate it too. I say, let it go, I was born, make mistakes. Grateful you love me, anyway. And then 
in the same vein. This is eight. Why is forgiveness so difficult when a hummingbird can beat its wings 90 times per second, fly backward, and drink nectar from honeysuckle? Shouldn't it be easy to say, sorry, I didn't mean to hurt you? This is 11. I like this. You know, I like very much, I I'm, I respond very much to William Collis Williams and Emily um, Dickinson, who also, I found out after I wrote a poem a day for a year, she wrote a poem a day for a year as well. Um, and so I love small moments that illuminate something, but quietly. And this is uh, 11. Going through old boxes, my hands are full of the dust I no longer need. Very much like, you know, the plums. And during the course of the year, um, I don't know, we traveled quite a bit. We went to Paris and later we went to uh, Mexico. And so I have in the, in the book, which I've uh, organized with in, by the seasons, uh, in the winter time, we went to this. So this is the winter season. We went to Paris, and this is a poem um, from Paris, seventeen. What are gargoyle, gargoyles but fancy gutters spitting water from carefully carved facades? We ask them to protect cathedrals, and they do. They are our desire to snap and snarl, what we long to accept, our deepest fears as tiny monsters. Standing at the do in the dome of Sacre-Cœur, I found mine, screaming, screaming bloody murder, afraid of heights. What ineffectual creatures, powerless to climb down the winding staircase and go home. We went up to the top of the cathedral and I was terrified of how high up we were. And I didn't think of myself as being scared of heights. <laughs> um, this is 67. Um, um, you'll see, 67. There's no thing so small that it won't come back to you. The bliss of walking from the pine forest to the dock and setting out on this lake to ski. Keep up your speed and you'll break through the wake. Ski on one ski, even skim on your feet alone, hydroplaning. All the nerves start in your feet. Spray obscures, knees bounce, shrieks of pleasure, Climb in the boat, legs shaking, shiver, sit on a wet towel, watch the next skier. It's okay to feel you've earned it. Think of all you've let go. When isn't this a test? Things you knew are in the silt, slowly oozing their way back, and you will get to choose whether to scoop them up or let them sink again. Go ahead. Take a second spin around the lake. That was probably, I don't know, in the summer. I, 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 I'm not clear, but then we went to Mexico and I'm going to read three uh, poems from Mexico. This is 77. Every city has a melody. Think of Mexico City, an exotic girlfriend. Her soprano verber reverberates into a sea of stars. El canto de una ciudad. We hear her in a marketplace. Silver, gemstones, paper woven bracelets, baskets, big wooden doors, their steel latches, back streets, the roads made of compressed lava. Claro que sí, she hums. 
The city's song streams from Las Niñas on the streets. Orange-shirted boys harmonize. Soccer players forever loved by dark girls. Buenos dias, she says in the elevator. Cinnamon and candy bread. Good morning to you, Mexico. A storm erupts. Light cracks. Lightning cracks the open sky. Dust and leaves swirling tornadoes. Raining rose petals. Sing Mexico's song. And then, of course, where we were, while we were there, we went to see uh, uh, Frida Kahlo and Diego Rivera's house. And um, so I wrote two different poems, one in the voice of Diego and one in the voice of Frida, 79 and 80. So this is 79. I'm Diego. That is true. I paint what I see. That is a lie. Weavers, sugar workers, campanistos, upright, thick bodies holding up a country, their heavy, heavy haunches rooted, their slanted eyes squint. Behind them, fields are impregnated with corn. Fires burn in smelters. Women wear glowing halos. Men are stars burning. Diego stopped making art cut loaves of hearty bread serving soup to the poor. Today is split pea. This is true. 80. I am Frida. I paint self-portraits. I am so often alone. She isolates her brittle bones and draws a cage encasing her torso. A rifle becomes her spine. Confined to a metal cot, strapped, pinned, and folded, sheets tuck her in tightly. Crutches, a fused skeleton, an ashen face bearing teeth. She draws herself. Fifty-five portraits. In her last paintings, she is out of focus. All that rage. One leg severed. Frida dimmed. An echo of an echo a marionette of her own making at her early death. Um, and I have one last poem. Well, no, I'm going to do two poems. Is that, do I have time, Harry? Am I good? Yes. Okay, great. Um, this is 95. <clears throat> the night is starless. Black light, posters, purple teeth, and marijuana. It's 1971, heavy, no sound, not even crickets. Vodka, dizzy air, thick molasses. Sticks cut my bare bottom, first Steve on top, then David breaking me open. David, the boy on the school bus. I slapped hard, Steve, the boy I had a schoolgirl crush on. At 50, I arrive at the scene, approach my 18-year-old self and say, let me handle this one for you. Throwing off the second one, fuck you, leave her alone. Before I take her home, my adult self walks down the country road, Steve whisper, and whispers to Steve how he'll pay for this for half his life. His fingers crush his cigarette. I tuck my drunk self into bed. Don't worry, I'll take care of this. She turns over like river stones. Good, I came back to check on her. Stupid girl. You'll grow up to love yourself, I say. And the last poem of the book is called is Poem 100. When it comes time, I will stand up and walk right out of my body. I have loved being alive, giving birth to my son, watching the moon rise, stars chasing dog, sitting in a rowboat on a lake at dusk, listening to the loons laugh, kissing your lips, touching you, touching me. I won't linger trying to remember those last words I wanted to say. Let me tell them to you now. I love you. 
This is not our last adventure. No matter how much we want to know what's next, death is the best mystery we have. I want to run into it with abandon, just the way I let the wind whip my hair into knots, writing next to you in your red convertible. Thanks for listening. Thank you very much, Adele. I remember one of your poems that you didn't read today, you you wrote such a relief to learn how to love oneself through art. And then listening to your poetry today, you know, your, your poetry is so precise and clear and it's quiet, but it's also strong. And you have a love of art and a love of oneself. And you also have such an excellent use of metaphor and simile. And your images are just so vivid. So I'm just so appreciative of, of what you have brought to us today. And there's so much, you know, your poetry is so lovely. So um, I would just like to ask you a few questions. When did you write your first poem? I was eight. <laughs> <laughs> I was, uh, my, 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 one of the reasons I dedicated the reading to my mother is that she really gave me my love of language. And I would write poems to make her happy and make her love me and make feel better, you know? So, uh, but I seriously started writing poems when I went to college and I went to university of Maryland and, um, I met, well, I, my first poet was, uh, Theodore Rethke and I loved his use of language, his, uh, use of metaphor. Um, and I think he would, in a weird way, his poetry saved my life, you know? What is it about the poetry form that attracts you to it? Well, I'm very similar to Alicia. I'm uh, lazy somewhat, <laughs> but also I, I just realized, I knew I always, I had problems spelling, horrible problems spelling, so much so that my uncle gave me a spelling dictionary for my birthday, which is impossible when you're a bad speller because you can't look up anything because you can't figure out how to spell it which would irritate me. But um, I now realized recently that I have sort of slight dyslexia. And, um, and when I was a kid, they didn't, and I just was reading an article about this recently, that um, uh, they didn't diagnose dyslexia for bright kids. They d diagnosed it for slow kids. So I was pretty, you know, I was bright. And in order to, combat not being able to spell i memorize tons and tons of words so i know words come like i'll hear a word in my head i have no idea how to spell it but i had memorized language by when i would read and i was a slow reader except when i liked the sound of the words on the page if i could read it to myself in my head i could read it really fast but if it wasn't musically beautiful to my ear i would it I would be like slogging through, you know? So I love the sound of language. I love, you know, how English is um, onomatopoetic and, you know, words sound like what they mean. And many, many of our words that we don't even think of, like words with a short I, like little and miniature and tiny and shrimp, all are all about small things, you know, or words with a beginning SL sound like sliver and sliding. They're all about shining objects, you know, and, and there's tons of words like that in English. I, I used to teach um, in poets in the schools and I would use that um, exercise with kids where we I go, let's, wor you know, good words. What are good words? And give them lists of good words to write poems with. It was so much fun. You're beguiling us with your language. <laughs> what uh, you mentioned, Red Key, uh, he's great too. And who are some of the other poets who influenced you before you began writing poetry in a serious way? Well, I write. I wrote poetry in a serious way as while I was reading poets. So it's not like you know. Although I love, you know, I love William Carlos Williams, um, and I love. Uh, Sylvia Plath and Anne Sexton very much and um, 
uh, Louise Gluck, who uh, unfortunately just passed away recently. She was a wonderful poet and teacher. Um, and, you know, unfortunately, I really love T.S. Eliot, even though he's his politics suck. But um, I love his sense of language. You know, I love the four quartets. It's, they're just magnificent. And uh, a love song of J. Alfred Prufrock, you know, and I love also um, W.B. Yeats. Um, and um, well, and I mentioned Nina Kassan earlier. She's quite wonderful poet. And um, it's funny how our, the Academy of Poets is very male and, you know, have to work to find really good female poets. Um, I love also Sharon Old's poetry. Um, uh, uh, Stephen Dunn is quite magnificent. One of my teachers, Stanley Plumley, and William J. Smith and Mark Strand, although pretty much of a womanizer, but a great poet, you know, like, um, yeah. So those are some of the poets. Well, you mentioned, uh, you know, the lack of women poets. I mean, there's so many great women poets in our time. Um, you two are fabulous. But And you mentioned Louise Glick. There's also Ada Limon, the first Latina to be the poet laureate. And obviously, uh, Natalie Cruz. And, um, oh, gosh. Elizabeth a, Bishop was also a fight. Elizabeth Bishop was wonderful. And Julia Alvarez. Uh, those are those are some great ones, too. Well, you have great taste. And thank you. Alicia Partnoy and Adele Slaughter for such, you both complement each other in different ways. You just bring together so much great inner strength and, and external observations and precision. And, and uh, I can't thank you enough. And so thank you. And I just have to make an announcement before we leave. Next Tuesday, we will be reading the sonnets. We, uh, the, the four great women uh, actors and uh, animation artists, uh, Corinne Connolly, Helen Richman, and Ruth Elliott, and Kay Wiseman will re be reading that. And just as a footnote, you mentioned Louise Glick. We've done a couple of readings of her poetry in the past. And on December 5th, we're doing a tribute to her. As you noted, Adele, she had passed on recently. And she she's a fabulous poet, too. And, and Stanley Kunitz, as you know, was her mentor, at least one of them. So thank you very much. It's been a wonderful reading. And Jennifer Clymer, uh, it's time for the next show. And thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Very powerful. Very, very powerful. Thank you for sharing. Thank you. Thanks for Thanks. listening.